rabies, is an extremely fatal viral disease affecting the central nervous system, caused by the highly neurotrophic rabies virus. This virus is mainly transmitted via contaminated saliva of infected animals through bites, scratches, wounds, mucosal exposure, and rarely through transplanted neurologic tissues, such as cornea. Rabies can be transmitted by a wide range of animals. Major ones include canines, like dogs and foxes, cats, bats, raccoons, or any other kind of mammal. Rabies is a bullet-shaped virion that belongs to the family of Rhabdoviridae and genus Lyssa virus. It contains a single-stranded RNA nucleocapsid core. The virus is able to evade immune surveillance by sequestration in the nervous system. And, this virus is not hardy and quickly inactivated by drying, UV and X-rays, detergents, and ether. Rabies is a vaccine-preventable disease by giving pre-exposure or post-exposure prophylaxis. It is extremely important to note that the patient should be vaccinated as soon as possible after an exposure. If not, rabies can be expected to follow its fatal course, with a mortality rate of 100%. First let's discuss about the pathophysiology of rabies. Currently understood pathophysiology is mainly based on the studies on canine rabies variants. Canine rabies in humans requires deep muscle inoculation. Once inside the muscle, endogenous muscle microRNA bind to viral transcripts and limit viral replication and protein production so that the virus can evade detection by antigen-presenting cells, such as macrophages. Because of the slow replication rate, virus spends a prolonged incubation period before the symptom onset. Once enough viral particles are made, they reach the neuromuscular junction. Then the virus is taken up by the motor neuron of the neuromuscular junction, and it propagates along the neuronal axon towards the spinal cord. This is also known as the retrograde transport of the virus. Virus travels along the motor axons at a rate of 12 to 24 mm per day. While traveling, virus elicits little inflammation in the motor neuron. At this point, prodromal symptoms of the disease start to appear, including pain and paresthesia at the inoculation site, fever and flu-like illness. I will discuss about these symptoms in more detail in the following sections. And unfortunately, when these symptoms appear, prophylactic treatment almost always becomes inefficient, and rabies is expected to follow its fatal course. Then the virus reaches the spinal cord, and then travels towards brain tissue. CNS spread is marked by rapidly progressing encephalitis. Thereafter, the virus travels to salivary glands and other visceral organs. This is known as the antiretrograde transport of the virus. It is important to note that rabies does not cause cytotoxicity. Neuronal morphology and lifespan are normal throughout the course of the disease. And death occurs from global neurologic and organ dysfunction. So, action of the virus is neurotoxic, rather than direct damage. In addition, rabies is characterized by the presence of negri bodies, which are eosinophilic aggregates of viral proteins found in the cytoplasm of neurons. Now let's discuss about the clinical presentation of rabies. As mentioned earlier, the virus follows a prolonged incubation period and it remains hidden from the immune system during this period, and no antibody response is observed. Average duration of the incubation is 20 to 90 days, and this may vary depending on the site of the scratch or bite. For example, a person whose inoculum occurs with a scratch on the hand may take a longer time to develop symptoms compared to a person whose inoculum occurs with a bite on the head or neck region. And rarely, some people develop symptoms years following the initial exposure. Clinical course of rabies can be divided into two phases, prodromal phase and acute neurologic phase. Prodromal phase starts as the virus enters into the central nervous system. Duration of this period is 2 to 10 days on average. During this phase, nonspecific signs and symptoms start to appear, like fever and flu-like illness. Paresthesia, pain, and intense itching at the inoculation site is pathognomonic for rabies and occurs in 30% of canine-associated rabies and 70% of bat-associated rabies cases. Other symptoms in this phase include the following. Anorexia. Headache. Fever and chills. Pharyngitis. Nausea. Diarrhea. Insomnia. Agitation. And depression. Acute neurologic phase is associated with objective signs of developing CNS disease. And patient ultimately goes into paralysis and coma, followed by death. However, some patients may die immediately after reaching this phase. 
Two-thirds of human rabies cases acquired from dogs manifest as furious rabies. Patients develop following signs and symptoms in furious rabies. Agitation. Restlessness. Muscle fasciculations. Seizures. Hallucinations. Thrashing. Episodic delirium. And aphasia. With time, these signs and symptoms become episodic and interspersed with calm, cooperative lucid periods. Furious episodes last less than five minutes. And they are triggered by visual, auditory, or tactile stimuli. Or may be spontaneous. Hydrophobia and aerophobia are pathognomonic for rabies and occur in about 50% of cases. Attempting to drink water or having air blown to the face will trigger severe laryngeal and diaphragmatic spasms, also known as hydrophobic spasms, and a sensation of asphyxia. In addition, autonomic instability is also observed with furious rabies, with symptoms including fever, tachycardia, hypertension, hyperventilation, Anisocoria, a condition where the sizes of pupils are different from each other, typically more than 0.4 mm. Fixed pupillary dilation, also known as blown eyes. Optic neuritis. Facial palsy. Mydriasis. Excessive salivation and lacrimation. And, postural hypertension. Remaining one-third of the patients develop paralytic rabies, also known as dumb rabies. In this type, the patient is relatively quiet compared to the furious type. Fever, headache, and nuchal rigidity are prominent in this type. Paralysis is symmetrical. Paralytic rabies may initially mimic Guillain-Barre syndrome with ascending lower motor neuron weakness. Sensory system is usually spared in paralytic rabies. And it gradually progresses into delirium, stupor, and coma. Followed by death. Coma starts within the first 10 days of acute neurologic phase and the duration of coma varies patient to patient. Common complications during this period include hyperventilation and metabolic acidosis, respiratory depression, variations in blood pressure and arrhythmias, and hypothermia. With intensive support, life is expected for three to four months. However, death is the usual outcome. It is important to determine brain death by brain biopsy and absence of cerebral arterial flow because some neurologic symptoms may falsely suggest brain death. Now let's discuss about the diagnosis of rabies. If the patient presents after an acute or recent bite, prophylactic treatment is initiated according to the category of exposure without using any diagnostic method. Meanwhile, animal behavior is observed in subsequent days if possible. Diagnosis for rabies usually requires in situations where the patient is unaware of an exposure and presence with encephalitis and suspected rabies or after the death of a person due to suspected rabies. Viral culture and PCR assays can be used to detect viral RNA in saliva and CSF samples. Skin biopsy from the nape of the neck can be used to detect antigens against rabies virus in cutaneous nerves and for histologic findings, including negri bodies, which I have mentioned earlier in this video. And sometimes, the virus can be directly visualized by an electron microscope. Neuronal death is rare in histologic findings. Corneal touch impression is a less preferable method for diagnosing rabies where the corneal epithelium is scraped for direct fluorescence antibody testing. This requires a topical ocular anesthetic and best performed by an ophthalmologist. Blood gas analysis can be used to detect respiratory alkalosis due to hyperventilation in the prodromal and early acute neurologic phases, followed by respiratory acidosis due to respiratory depression later. Hematologic studies may reveal atypical monocytes in blood. And EEG changes occur due to generalized spasm of cerebral arteries. Now let's discuss about the management of rabies. I would say this is the most important topic in this video. So, you need to know this part extremely well. Management of rabies includes local wound care, pre-exposure prophylaxis or passive immunization, and post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP. Pre-exposure prophylaxis or passive immunization is given before contact with a rabid animal for people who are at risk, such as veterinarians, veterinary students, persons who regularly explore or hike in caves, laboratory workers who are exposed to rabies virus through handling of specimens, and people who visit countries where rabies is a significant problem. CDC and WHO recommend two doses of cell culture vaccine intramuscularly or intradermally on day zero and three for pre-exposure prophylaxis. For passive immunization, human rabies immunoglobulin can be administered.
For patients present after an exposure, local wound care should be started immediately. This is essential even if the person presents long after the exposure. Local wound care includes immediate washing and flushing the wound for 15 minutes with soap and water, or water alone, and disinfection with detergent, ethanol, iodine, or other substances with viricidial activity. Suturing is usually postponed. Due to the high likelihood of getting infected by entrapped bacteria from the saliva of the animal. In addition, antibiotic treatment and tetanus prophylaxis should be given as necessary. Post-exposure prophylaxis should be considered immediately following an exposure. Post-exposure prophylaxis can be given by administration of the rabies vaccine or rabies immunoglobulin or both. It depends on the type of the exposure. WHO has categorized all the exposures into three types. Category 1 includes touching or feeding animals, licks on intact skin, or licks on intact skin with secretions or excretions of a rabid animal or person. These situations are not regarded as exposures. So, post-exposure prophylaxis is not required for Category 1 exposures. Category 2 includes nibbling of uncovered skin and minor scratches or abrasions without bleeding. In these instances, rabies vaccine should be injected as soon as possible. Category 3 exposures include single or multiple transdermal bites or scratches, licks on broken skin, contamination of mucous membranes with saliva from licks, exposure to bats, bites to head, neck, face, hand, and genitals, and deep wounds associated with bleeding. In all these instances, both rabies vaccine and immunoglobulin should be administered at distant sites as soon as possible. As mentioned earlier, administration of rabies immunoglobulin is recommended for Category 3 exposures. Two types of immunoglobulin are used. Either human rabies immunoglobulin or equine rabies immunoglobulin. Infiltrate rabies immunoglobulin into the depth of the wound and around the wound. RIG should be infiltrated around the wound as much as anatomically feasible. Remaining RIG should be injected at an intramuscular site, distant from that rabies vaccine inoculation, anterior thigh, for an example. If RIG is not available on first visit, its administration can be delayed by maximum seven days from the date of first rabies vaccine dose is given. If the calculated RIG dose is insufficient to infiltrate all the wounds, sterile saline can be used to dilute the vaccine as necessary. Administration of rabies vaccine is recommended for Category 2 and 3 exposures. Two types of rabies vaccines are available. Human diploid cell vaccine and purified chick embryo cell vaccine. Three intramuscular schedules are available for the administration of rabies vaccine. Five-dose regimen, 211 regimen, and four-dose regimen with rabies immunoglobulin in both category two and three exposures. Rabies vaccines should be injected to the deltoid muscle for adults and children aged two years or more. For younger children, anterolateral thigh is recommended. And vaccines should not be injected to the gluteal region because it may reduce the antibody response. In five-dose regimen, each dose of vaccine should be administered on days 0, 3, 7, 14, and 28 into the deltoid region of adults and anterolateral thigh region in younger children. In 2-1-1 regimen, two doses are given on day 0 in the deltoid muscle of both right and left arms, and additional one dose each given on day 7 and 21. In addition to above-mentioned intramuscular regimens, intradermal preparations also available for post-exposure prophylaxis of rabies. These regimens require a reduced volume of vaccine to be utilized than any of the intramuscular regimens. So, it reduces the vaccine cost by 60 to 80 percent. These preparations are more appropriate where vaccine and money are in short supply, such as in rural hospitals. Finally, I would like to mention some important facts to keep in mind on post-exposure prophylaxis of rabies. Patients presenting for rabies post-exposure prophylaxis even months after having been exposed should be treated as if the contact had recently occurred. PEP does not have any contraindications if purified rabies immunoglobulin and vaccine are used. Pregnancy and infancy are not contraindications. PEP should be administered even if the suspected animal is not available for testing or observation. And, vaccine and immunoglobulin administration may be discontinued if the animal is a vaccinated domestic animal. Or, remaining healthy for 10 days following observation. Or, humanely killed and declared negative for rabies. I have taken all this information on management of rabies from the latest WHO guidelines.
I would highly recommend you to go through those guidelines, as well as the guidelines that match your geographic region. Because it is extremely important that you know all these information to make sure that your patient gets the right treatment on time. I will put a link to WHO guidelines on rabies prophylaxis in the description box. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video.